African-American and women's history scholar. And uh, the montage I thought was incredible because it showed people internationally in the movements of the past and the present. And I, I think they include just about everybody. I, I really love that video. I hope you did too. Um, today, we're going to start with a, a land acknowledgement. We are here in Portland, Oregon, Multnomah County, um, standing on um, native land, indigenous land, and we honor the Multnomah tribe and other indigenous people that occupied this area in the past and the present. Um, so this particular panel is coordinated by Portland DSA's Feminist Caucus. I'm Natasha Beck, your moderator, and I am co-chair of the Feminist Caucus. Um, the other co-chair is Jane, um, Jane Miramontes Somerville, and um, we'll be co-hosting, and we also have other people helping us, uh, such as Jeremy <clears throat> Salmon doing tech work, um, Eric Gold doing uh, tech work and other troubleshooting, and uh, Viha, Vihad, who is not here, who has also he's assisted with us our graphics and publicity. So this afternoon, we're going to be <clears throat> hearing from three panelists. The first one is Jan Hawken, the second is Olivia Pace, and the third is Luisa Martinez, all our members of Portland DSA. Jan Hawken will go first. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. She is a professor emeritus of psychology at Portland State University, a clinical psychologist, and an award-winning documentary filmmaker. She has directed six feature-length films, including Our Bodies, Our Doctors. Jan will show a 10-minute clip from Our Bodies, Our Doctors and discuss reproductive justice in the United States. Our second panelist, will be Olivia Pace. She IDs as a black, biracial, and queer woman, and she is a writer, educator, and organizer. She's a 2019 cum laude graduate of Portland State University with a BA in Child and Family Studies and a minor in Black Studies. Today, she'll be talking about union organizing at her workplace. And our third presenter <clears throat> is the current co-chair of Portland DSA, Luisa Martinez. Um, she is also in leadership of the DSA International Committee and editor at Partisan Magazine. She was an undocumented dreamer, as in the DREAM Act, until she was 21, when she attended college and then graduate school as a first generation college and university student. She believes the current system can um, um, current system needs to be burned to the ground before we start over again. Okay, and and uh, Luisa will be presenting on how we can understand immigration law from a socialist feminist perspective. We will have time for questions and answers after each presenter uh, gives her presentation. Um, so I'd like uh, to welcome Jan Hawken. Thank you. Thank you for having me uh, as part of the panel today than the, this event. Um, what better way to spend Women's History Month? Um, I want to say a little bit as introduction to the highlights that you'll be seeing from Our Bodies, Our Doctors. It's actually a feature length film. It's about 70 minutes, but um, the, the um, Highlights are about seven minutes and I've organized them around some key themes I'd like to touch on today. I think are particularly important with um, fem socialist feminists organizing around abortion and reproductive justice. Just a, a bit of background. Um, the film came out of a, a, a project at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor and the faculty there had been doing research around the world on the experiences of abortion providers and how they were dealing with stigma. And so they wanted to take their research findings into the medium of, of, of a film, partly in recognition that the anti-abortion forces in this country have really dominated visual culture. You look up abortion and you see bloody fetuses and, um, and the imagery often that 
comes to mind associated with abortion. So they were really interested in bringing abortion care out from the margins into the into the center of um, visual space and kind of reclaiming visual culture. And one of the findings that was important in their research that I carried into the first two short films I did with them, and then this long, uh, this feature length, long form, uh, titled Our Bodies, Our Doctors, was that um, stigma involves distancing from a group on the margins or people on the margins, casting an activity or a group as outside the norm, outside a kind of fold of dependency and a, a disavowal of our dependency on a particular group, whether it's farm workers, whether it's women, whether it's people of color, in this case, abortion providers. And so by bringing this group into the fold of human experience and also acknowledging our dependency on them, we're engaging in a, a kind of political work, a, a cultural work that um, is meant to counter uh, um, this dynamic of stigma. So my project was to bring um, abortion providers and the work of abortion care on a, into everyday healthcare and everyday people's lives. And in carrying out and doing two short films through the University of Michigan, I came to feel there was a longer story to be told. Um, the two short films are on my website, one's titled and you can watch them for free, being there. The other one's titled um, Kuepo, it's set in Kenya. But I thought that there, in the course of making those two short films, there was a lot to learn from providers about feminist principles of care, not only access to care, but how do we think about a feminist model of healthcare, a less hierarchical model? So while doctors is in the title of this film, Our Bodies Are Doctors, and it does feature doctors who've been the most, the, the subject to the most violent attacks over the decades, it also includes a much broader identity as providers, people who work in offices, the nurses, assistants, everyone that has to be um, part of a commitment to providing this care. So I, I felt there was a lot to learn from uh, abortion providers, not only about the need for abortion care, but about how we resist oppressive practices, how we stand up on ethical grounds against people who are um, oppressing particularly marginalized communities, as we all know, who are most affected by denial of abortion services. And then there is also this question of how do you bring abortion um, into the um, center of the stage and, and, and take up this issue um, and not and not distance ourselves from the same time, place it within the context of reproductive health care as one of many aspects of reproductive health care. So um, with that as an introduction, I'm gonna play, um, have Jeremy play the, the um, highlights video and be aware that uh, with Vimeo, I mean with um, Zoom, you do have this drop frame problem, so it may sputter a bit. But that's a function of, of Zoom. So I hope you'll bear with it. And um, we'll talk about it after some other comments um, after watching the, these highlights. Eight weeks and below, we see just the gestational sac. And that's easy for most people. Beyond that, we do start seeing recognizable fetal parts. And there are people who are comfortable with that theoretically, but still have some sort of aversion, a gut reaction to seeing a more developed fetus. For other people, it's just like, oh my God, that is so cool. For those of us who've studied embryology to actually see it in different stages. 
you're going to hear the machine turn on, and it's going to be about 30 seconds of um, suctioning. Okay, so just some, some cramping during this, all right? Let the makers help you and blow it out. Good job. As much as abortion is a procedure that should be considered normal and is safe and shouldn't be stigmatized, it is a procedure that occurs when something undesired has happened and you're, you know, and you're trying to reconcile it. It's not like getting plastic surgery, you know. It's, it's, this is an unwanted event that you're dealing with. Hang in there, sweetie. It's almost over. You're doing great. I think you want to acknowledge that. But at the same time, if you linger too much on that, people will use that as a reason why abortion shouldn't be, uh, you know, why abortion's a negative, you know? It's because the, just because the circumstances are negative doesn't mean the procedure itself is. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a speculum in, just exactly. like when you have a pap smear, okay? You're doing so great. I think women so come in beautiful. feeling like that if they're grieving or they're sad, that that means that they're doing something wrong. We talk about that a lot. I tell them, look, just because you're sad about something doesn't mean it's the wrong thing to do. We go up to 26 weeks through 21 weeks as a two-day procedure, and then from 22 weeks to 26 as a three-day procedure. People end up being that far along for a few reasons. Figuring out you're pregnant, getting it together, and often they'll spend some time trying to get money together before they even go in to see anybody. Unfortunately, oftentimes the women who are the most needy, those that have the most profound social issues or financial challenges, are the least able to get abortion services because of the distance they have to travel or the time they have to take or the health insurance loops that they have to jump through. And as a consequence, they end up in the second trimester or, or even later and they have to then have an abortion that's much more complicated and carries greater risk. I think it's ironic that the anti-choice movement has in fact effectively pushed uh, abortions into later in pregnancy. As I was transitioning more fully into my identity as a feminist, I was introduced to the concept of reproductive justice. Well, the beauty of the reproductive justice framework is that it ends the isolation of abortion from other social justice issues. And so it allows us to have the conversation about abortion at the same time we're talking about white supremacy or, or economic injustice or welfare rights or HIV AIDS or housing or police brutality, all the other things that go on in our community. Reproductive justice allows for a framework that is inclusive of issues that would be seemingly remote from one another. It's not about are you for adoption, are you for abortion, are you for birth justice, are you for LGBTQ rights. Uh, a reproductive justice framework allows for the intersectionality of these issues. And so I think that is our best ally right now, that we have an intersectional inclusive framework that allows us to have conversations with people who are uncomfortable maybe only focusing on abortion. Because, you know, reproductive justice is the right to have a child and not have a child and to parent our kids. Since I left working for the Catholic Hospital and over the 25 ensuing years, the ethical directives have really taken over. So this is a list of rules, basically, that you're supposed to apply when taking care of patients in a Catholic healthcare system. And the bishop of whatever area can determine the degree to which the ERDs should be enforced. And then individual hospitals sometimes even vary how they interpret the bishop's interpretation. The language is a little bit tricky around ectopic pregnancy. 
So an ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that is located outside of the uterus. They are not viable. And this can be catastrophically dangerous, but to the letter of the law, within Catholic ERDs, you are ending a fetal life, which is not allowed. And that is held to the same value or higher value than a woman's life. I've heard many times from colleagues or, or other people, you know, nobody likes to do abortions, but somebody's got to do them. You know, it's a necessary evil. And I actually completely disagree with that. I enjoy incorporating abortion care into my life. Right now, about one in every three women has an abortion at some point in the United States. As long as women are getting pregnant, abortion is going to need to be around. When there's a hospital that's becoming Catholic, you need the cardiologists, you need the anesthesiologists, you need everybody to stand up and say, our ethical directives are to take care of our patients. Now we're at a juncture where we have a government that's trying to outlaw abortion, stigmatize it, defund it, and to do so is not going to mean that abortion need is, is going to go away. I think we make assumptions also about how this has to be a really private thing. And I'm going to tell a, a brief story just to show that not everybody feels that way. I was at SeaTac Airport getting a muffin, <laughs> and the woman behind the counter looks at me and she said, I know you, in this, in this volume voice, you did my abortion. <laughs> Lots of people in line, other people she works with standing right there, and I'm like, yes, I did. <laughs> Well, I hope you will all um, go onto the website, Our Bodies, Our Doctors, and see the film if you haven't or want to see it again. Um, I, I feel so honored to be part of this project with these um, incredibly thoughtful and inspiring and ethical providers and learning from their experience. And I feel it's... Um, it was a commitment for them to be part of the film, as it was for a number of women who um, offered to have their procedure filmed. There were, I think, nine or 10 women who offered to do that, um, who agreed to, um, out of their own commitment to the care that, um, that they, and their way of, of expressing gratitude for the care of doctors and other providers who were there for them. I'd like to talk a little bit about that first theme. What does it mean to reclaim complexity in thinking about abortion? And of course, as socialist feminists, we understand that we bring an intersectional analysis to abortion care or any issue that um, there's race, class, and gender intersecting in, in complex ways and not simply additive ways. Um, but it also, I, th I think there are different reasons to support abortion, and some of them are very problematic. So in the course of making this film, I would hear people say things like, well, there are too many people having children anyway. There are too many women having babies who can't care for them. And so you sometimes have very reactionary arguments, um, or there's the liberal kind of argument of many people that would defend Planned Parenthood um, on the grounds that, well, Planned Parenthood, only 5% only of their services are abortion. The rest of what they do is other GYN care. And I would say, well, that may be true, but it's a little bit like saying, please forgive me for this small sin for the greater good we do. And Actually, abortion, feminist abortion clinics were important for me to feature here. These are all ind independent women's clinics because they have a commitment to this care, but they also provide other kinds of care that you, you learn about in the film. But they're unapologetically abortion, unapologetic abortion providers. Uh, reclaiming compl complexity also for me meant um, Acknowledging the emotional complexity of abortion, I think it's even in feminist um, organizing, it's easy to rely on the, the tragic story of 
the woman who um, is carrying a fetal anomaly um, or the person whose life is falling apart. Um, and some of that, you know, that's been around a long time. Even before Roe v. Wade, there were ways of getting a therapeutic abortion. If you went to a hospital and told, you know, had two doctors sign off that you would kill yourself if you had to carry this pregnancy or kill your children. So that was a really important part of the feminist, the second wave uh, feminist campaign around abortion was to say, we don't have to have an excuse of an abortion. We don't have to have a tragic story to um, convince an authority figure, a doctor, um, that this is an okay thing to do. And I, so I think it's, for, for me in making this film, it was important to take up issues like, for some women there is loss. For some, moving into the second trimester is problematic because the care is more difficult, the procedure is more risky, uh, second term abortion. So I think it's really important for us as a movement to take on the issue of later term terminations because that's where there's the most prejudice the most hostility toward women and providers who provide the who provide uh, uh, second term um, abortions. And when I started the project, I assumed that those who are primarily due to fetal anomalies, but then in the course of the project, found that that actually isn't true. There are some carrying fetal anomalies, but there are. But for the most part, these are are women in very stressful life circumstances and have had many barriers and obstacles and complicated parts to their lives that have made it a, difficult to access an abortion or to decide whether to have an abortion. And for, for some people, three or four months is not that long. And so I think that's really important to take on some of these areas of the fight for abortion rights where support drops off and where the prejudices against women of color, um, poor women are the most uh, intense. And then finally, I wanted to include um, this part about the Catholic bishops because I think we're used to the crazy preachers out there on the streets with their signs with the bloody fetuses, but actually, more of the power now in this issue is with with Catholic hospitals and bishops who and people in in suits that look very um, sane and professional, but who profoundly affect access to health care, including here in Oregon. Providence controls about half of the beds here. Um, now, many women who have an abortion don't most don't need to go to the hospital, but if you need to be in the hospital, you need to have access. And at Providence Hospitals, as long as there's a fetal heartbeat, they will not perform an abortion. And even though women's lives are at risk. So I think it's um, important as, as we have seen actually to organize around the, um, the Catholic healthcare system and, and here in Oregon last year, the Providence um, attempted a merger with CARE Oregon, which would have made that secular hospital that serves many poor people, um, would have, uh, you, on Medicaid, would have prevented that hospital providing, um, from providing abortion care as well as other care, end of life care, LGBTQ services. Um, but because the community organized in opposition to that, um, they were not able to, um, to accomplish that merger. So it does make a difference to have um, communities organize around these very powerful healthcare institutions. And so um, that also is, I think, an important, just as a final point, was, it was important for us to include the, the history of Sister Song and reproductive justice and their work, the, the contributions of Black feminist thought to how to reframe abortion as an issue that intersects so many other aspects 
of women's lives. Um, so thank you very much. And I look forward to any questions participants have. Thank you so much, Jana. Um, that was wonderful. It was, that was really powerful to hear. Um, so I will be moderating the Q&A session. Um, so if anyone in the audience or any of the other panelists um, has a question, if you could just post um, the word stack in the chat um, or in the or in the Q&A, just like we would in a regular um, DSA meeting, and then I can go ahead and start calling on people. Catherine, um, and I think I have to, okay, Catherine, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm just interested. I always like, I like data <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm curious about what we know about the women who are having a difficult time getting abortions here in Oregon. I, we, I understand if they're under stress, if they're poor, um, just like I, more, more demographics <laughs> can speak to that or, you know, who, who these, who these women are, um, how we can help them. Yeah. In the Portland area, and particularly in that, um, Oregon, has liberal have has no we do not have legal restrictions on abortion but and Oregon does have um, cover Medicaid funding that the that is prohibited at the federal level and that's an important fight now we need to continue to have is to overturn the Hyde Amendment which Democrats and Republicans over the years have have reauthorized. And I think now we are getting, making some headway on that. But at any rate, it's not difficult to get an abortion in the Portland metro area. But if you go out to rural areas where even in Oregon, where the only, um, where, where clinicians are more isolated, that's another dynamic that um, I became more sensitized to in the making of this film. And of course, as socialist feminists, we're, we're aware of how much, how important it is to be part of a group and group support. And, and like OH, most of the places I filmed were places where there was a lot of support in the community uh, medical centers or big offices where people could count on each other. And indeed, that was part of what made these feminist independent clinics so vulnerable to violence in the 90s was that they were separated off kind of as street front clinics and more vulnerable to the terrorism of that period. So in small towns, even doctors or providers who are, who are, um, sympathetic are afraid of being targeted people putting signs baby killer on their office doors and so when i was looking for people in rural areas to include in the film it was almost impossible because a lot of providers said look i support this but i cannot be out in my community it's just too risky i can't have my patients come in the waiting room and have this their propaganda spread all over. So um, often people in rural areas have to travel some distance to an urban area to get a procedure. That, so that's kind of the, the main dynamic. There, there's more um, you might pursue in terms of the data um, through NARAL, uh, pro-choice organ as well, or Planned Parenthood. All right, Natasha, you're next on stack. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, Catherine, for your question. Um, I wanted to ask Jan to sort of look at a retrospective. Now, I first met you um, in, um, I think it was winter or spring of 1979, and you came to a meeting of the Socialist Feminist Task Force. 
which was then the New Oak American Movement, later merged uh, and became DSA. Anyway, so um, those of us who were doing reproductive rights work in the 70s, uh, it seems like we had to start not that soon after Roe v. Wade got passed. For me, I got into it 77, more or less. And I remember we had a reproductive rights slideshow that Eugene, uh, the Eugene Nam group had, had done and we'd edited and then um, Catherine Pritchard and I showed it at the national convention. And we did a lot of networking. We did a lot of, of, of work in coalitions. How would you say the work in the late seventies, early eighties is different from the work around reproductive justice? We used to say reproductive rights. Now we say justice to be more inclusive. How do you think it's the same? And how do you think it's, the diff it's different? Well, in two minutes, okay. I, yeah, I, I did my PhD dissertation on the history of, of, the, um, of the abortion rights movement and worked at the Feminist Women's Health Center in LA. And there was a lot of fear in the 70s that we were going to lose the right, that Roe v. Wade would be overturned quickly. And the feminist clinic movement emerged and it was kind of a mixed bag. I mean, I, uh, there was a lot of um, radical feminist um, work during that period that was important, but there was also a kind of fortifying of the borders, especially later as the right wing came into more power in the eighties and nineties, there was a kind of, um, I, I think, I mean, there was a lot of clinic defense work, which was good, but also I, I think now there's less of the overt violence that there was in the 90s. So I think people are less terrorized. Um, and I think that's a function of a, a lot of organizing. But I think a lot of the radical vision of abortion rights, um, was, was lost in certain respects. It's been difficult to keep a lot of the independent feminist clinics going. And I think there's a lot to be learned from them. But at the same time, um, I, I think the, that vision of abortion on demand without apology, which was really strong in the in the 1980s. And there was a lot of anti-doctor sentiment. Like when I worked in feminist clinics, I was a registered nurse, and we did not allow doctors who were all men to touch a patient. They were just very, like they were an extension of a piece of equipment because they were so powerful. And so we had a very hard line on that, you know? <laughs> and now a lot of doctors are women, so that has shifted. And um, the, the gender struggle is, is, different now because so many women are in the field. Um, so I think each period has its challenges, but I think that that idea of abortion on demand without apology, um, also demanding childcare, which is the ne another topic, was part of the abortion rights movement is tying it to childcare that we, we need to not only refuse to have, bring children into the world, um, not of our choosing, but also to be able to take care of the children we do have and that we have to bring the care of children and the refusal of forced motherhood together. And I think that is really coming back through the reproductive justice movement. Great, thank you. All right, well, I have put myself on stack um, for the last question before we move on to Louisa. So I am, I'm curious if you, I, so much of our, um, you know, discussion around, um, around abortion and around, you know, just general gyne gynecological care is, of course, very heteronormative, very focused on women, very focused on pregnant women. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anything that you found in your research, or, you know, if you can speak to the experience, maybe the unique experience of LGBTQ people, um, accessing abortion and how that's different. So of course, not not everyone that accesses abortion identifies as a woman, not everyone that is straight. Um, so if there's anything you have to say about that, I, I would love to hear it. 
Yeah, and there's, a, I think, a lot of um, really important steps to attend to language, to talk, use terms like pregnant people. Many of the clinics now, I think all of the clinics where I film provide um, care for trans people and also, um, you know, a range of services want to be a safe space for people to talk about sex, whether they have anal sex, whether they have, you know, any kind of sexual practices and to have queer friendly spaces. And that has become part of feminist principles of care. And I think understanding that the abortion issue and the, the intense investment in it on the part of conservatives is bound to a very heteronormative patriarchal worldview that, um, that assumes that there are rigid gender roles and, and rigid boundaries defining sexuality and gender. So I, I think that there, there is a, a lot of attunement to that. I, it is still the case that I think most um, most people who get abortions um, are ident identify as women, so I, I often still will refer to pregnant women, but I understand people also are sensitive to, to not assuming it's only women getting abortions. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, awesome. So. Unfortunately, Olivia has actually had to drop out. Um, she is feeling ill, but um, that does mean that we have a little bit of extra time. Does anyone have any additional questions for Jan before we, before we move on? Natasha. Yeah, um, <clears throat> with respect to what you all were saying about um, not all pregnant people are women, um, I read uh, two stories about um, trans men who had um, given birth through uh, alternative insemination. And um, one, I think, did it twice. And I'm not recalling his name, but he's very involved in national level uh, uh, advocating for parents of all um, types. And uh, he actually is based in the Portland area. And um, so he and his partner, no, actually, no, they have, they did, he got alternative inseminated once. And then he and his partner um, adopted uh, a member of the partner's family. Anyway, so, but they, they just, they've had very open discussions with their children about where they came from and why everybody doesn't look alike. And things like that. And I think that's just a whole new model. And um, do you think we're going to see more of this in the future? Or uh, there's still backlash against it. But I'm thinking that there are more physicians and other healthcare people that are supportive of it. What is your um, thinking on that? Um, I, I went to a, a panel at a medical convention a year or so ago. And the, and the panel on trans care was a packed room and it was kind of interesting how people were clearly very, and this was a OBGYN um, conference. And I mean, part of what the, the trans participants on the panel described was it's very, very difficult to go off your hormones to then, um, to then carry a pregnancy. And it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. And of course, I think it's also the case that, that people who go through fertility planning now or go through a fertility regime, go through a horrendous amount of hormonal intervention. So in some ways it's part of that same, um, same situation. And I mean, I, I think it's so important to, to respect and support the decisions of people, but I, I also think it's, it's important not to overly romanticize what's involved in, in some of the 
the medical aspects of this care while supporting people who make the choice. Um, there's a lot, lot involved in it. And um, I think the same thing is we could say for, you know, fertility planning and um, in terms of the course of, of um, procedures that, that people have to go through to who are having trouble getting pregnant. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jan. Um, I think that finishes up our Q and A. Um, uh, okay. So, that should be Louisa. yeah. Uh, so we're ready to move on to our next panelist. As uh, Jane said, uh, our panelist Olivia had to leave. She's not feeling well. So we're going to go ahead with um, Louisa Martinez, who is, uh, as I said before, but if you came in late, she is the newly elected co-chair of the Portland chapter of DSA. And she is also involved in international work with um, the International Committee and, on DSA. And she is editor of Partisan Magazine. And she came to this country as an undocumented dreamer. Um, when she was, and when she was 21, she was able to attend college and then graduate school as a first gener generation college student. So uh, Louisa is going to be talking about how we can understand immigration law from a socialist feminist perspective. Thank you, Louisa, for being here. Hey, no problem. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and screen share. So I don't know, let's see. Hmm. So when I see that, you guys can see my notes, right? When I share this way? I can see it, yeah. Mm, okay, I wonder how I'm gonna do this then. Okay, so I'll try to, um, I'll try to go off memory. So just uh, really briefly about myself, uh, my name is Lisa Martinez. Um, I have been um, active in a number of organizations that, um, that focus on immigrants' rights uh, or immigrants' justice issues, um, Interfaith Alliance. Um, I was on the board for the Florida, Florida Immigrant Coalition, which is the largest coalition in, um, uh, in the state of Florida based out of Miami. And so uh, just lots and lots of organizations <laughs> to do with immigration. Um, uh, also, I, you know, I, that wasn't enough. I went to graduate school and what I uh, decided to learn about and study was um, uh, immigration and labor, particularly how those two topics intersect. Um, and it obviously really resonated with me because I, you know, I've essentially devoted my, um, uh, my life to, to uh, not just socialism, but of course the labor movement. So um, one question that we could explore is, um, you know, how do we understand immigration from a socialist, uh, uh, socialist feminist perspective, right? And these are all arguments, of course, and I really fully get the answer, but um, it's, it's something that we could certainly talk about. Oh, one joke I make, um, because of my background as a professional immigrant, I've stopped saying that because it's, well, for one thing, it's really not that funny, but uh, for, for another thing, it's just, um, uh, it's just a, a, a uh, uh, interesting way of opposing one's existence. I'm professionally not from here. Um, so one of the things um, that I often uh, try to highlight when talking about immigration is this idea that, you know, that we've, just how problematic the idea is that we have special language for special people, right? And so, um, uh, you know, when I was, and particularly looking at this term illegal aliens, right? So, uh, when I was in graduate school, I took immigration law at the University of Florida uh, College of Law. And so we got um, issued, uh, the book we used was Legomsky and Rodriguez, um, Immigration and um, uh, Immigration and Nationalization Law in the United States, something like that. And so on the first page of that book, and I always thought this was interesting, is uh, this, this is page number one. Um, and so I, you know, it's bad teaching 101 to read off the PowerPoint, but I think because of, um, uh, because I do want to share 
uh, I'm going to go ahead and do it. So in early editions of this book, I'm realizing I'm getting blocked. Hold on just a second. Let me move my bar here. Um, so in early editions of this book, striving for precision and for consistency with the statutory terminology, right, consistent with Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1952, similarly used the term alien in that technical sense. Even the first edition drew the line at the pejorative, irritating, and technically meaningless term illegal alien and explained why. But the word alien, even when not adorned with the modifier illegal, has always struck a disturbing chord. Many feel that the term connotes dehumanizing qualities of either strangeness or inferiority, so space aliens come to mind, and that its use builds walls, strips human beings of their essential dignity, and needlessly reinforces an outsider status. Some believe that its constant use and repetition also solidify racial and cultural stereotypes. Beginning with the third edition, therefore, the book stopped using the term alien, except in direct quotations, and the word non-citizen conveys the same meaning without the baggage. Um, and as explained, uh, non-national is more precise, uh, but the word non-citizen um, uh, gets employed in the book. So I wanted to share that because, uh, you know, this is coming from, this is not some like feel-good book. It's, um, you know, the most fun uh, 1,400 pages you'll read in your life. And, you know, it's really kind of uh, a nuts and bolts um, it's a law class, right? They're not going to, you know, we're not talking about, this isn't a poetry class. And so, you know, I, I, I did find, I did think that it was um, meaningful that that was on the first page. So, so keeping with this, right, this idea of uh, le illegal, Im uh, illegal aliens, illegal immigrants, and, uh, you know, what this narrative, uh, the way that this narrative has been employed, you know, you see this with the European refugee crisis, right? That's often the way that it's referred to as. Um, and so, you know, it's really important to understand that this is, um, <laughs> this type of rhetoric is really uh, ingrained in, in uh, you know, some of the propaganda that you saw as part of the Third Reich. And I, you know, I get this is the internet, and there's a joke about, like, it's only a matter of time before somebody makes a reference to Hitler. I do believe that this is, like, a, an appropriate reference. Um, I feel like it's a good argument. Uh, so, you know, some of the some of the ways that um, not just Jewish people, all undesirables were referred to as were, you know, untermensch, or rats and uh, viruses, basilisk, um, you know, everything, everything but human, right? Um, and so the reason for doing that is not to get people who are already there, right? If you're referring to uh, uh, immigrants or, or Jews as rats or whatever, you're, you're, you're kind of already to the far right. The point of that is really to just kind of get people on the margin. So, you know, you have this group of people that maybe you're not all that warm to anyway. Um, and then you keep hearing this over and over again. They're, they're, they're illegal. They're a virus. They're, they're coming here in droves, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's useful in driving people past that margin, right? Getting them um, uh, to a position where they do start to see people who are um, uh, of this group, right? Whatever it, however it is characterized as subhuman. And as a result of that, we can do subhuman things to them, which is a really interesting term because, you know, human beings are the only ones who do this shit to one another, right? Animals have far more dignity and respect <laughs> towards one another, you know, to the extent that cruelty exists, it's not done with any type of um, intent, uh, certainly not with pleasure. So anyway, uh, so this is the type of, of, of propaganda that you see um, uh, that goes back many generations. And so you saw that, right, with the description of uh, African refugees in Europe, uh, British Prime Minister Cameron referred to them as uh, coming in swarms. And so, um, and so here's a photo of Nigel Farage. This is front of an uh, anti-immigrant poster. It's got, you know, big red letters, breaking point, right? Um, you know, really cutting corners here in terms of the terminology. And so um, this is clearly anti-immigrant propaganda. And so in contrast to that, um, uh, you know, just kind of some of the stuff that we uh, heard again, once again, through the rise of the Nazi party. Um, so despite all this, um, you know, this uh, terminology that's clearly been grounded in, in a, a really racist um, and um, a particularly cruel terminology, I did not stop, I will say, uh, the Gainesville Sun from <laughs> calling me an illegal immigrant. Uh, this is a story that I collaborated on, uh, just this is a local newspaper and stuff like that. But, um, it, you know, it's fine. I'm not going to 
cry over this microaggression of whatever we want to call it. Um, it uh, looks far worse on them than it does on me. Um, you know, I'm just like, I was like a 20 some year old kid just trying to get a master's degree. Uh, you know, they were the ones, uh, they're the ones who sound like Nazis, like not me. So, um, so that kind of takes us to, oh, wait, damn it. Okay. So, um, in a way, as a way of making this interactive, at least to a, a teeniest degree, can I ask, um, if anybody knows, maybe you just put it in the chat, um, who can guess when the first anti-immigrant law was? Um, was it with the Chinese Exclusion Act? In the... Um, so... Does anybody else want to guess? That would have so, been my guess too. Alien sedition. So, so yes, Alien and Sedition Act. So I can actually, I'll get to that. So in terms of actually targeting, um, so a lot of people say the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? And so I think that is helpful in terms of, um, or I think, I think part of it is that it's got Chinese right in the name and exclusion, right? Again, not really mincing words here, um, but uh, it was actually, if we're thinking in terms of identifying a particular group of people, it was actually the Page Act. So let me see if I can share screen again. Yeah. So it was actually the Page Act of uh, 1875. And so that was, um, it was anti-Chinese. Uh, this, this guy, Horace Page, he uh, essentially built his kind of a political career off of attacking immigrants. And so the Page Act um, uh, targeted Chinese coolies, right? That was the term used at the time. It's one of those words where it's like, I don't know if you ever heard, you ever hear like a term, it's like, ooh, that's old school. That's old school, it's like some shit my grandma would say. Um, we don't use that term anymore, but it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was what Chinese people were referred to as, particularly laborers, but it really centered the white nuclear family um, in, in terms of some of the rhetoric that, that was used to pass it. So you had this guy, Horace Page, uh, Horace F. Page, I believe his name was, and so he actually got uh, a doctor to testify on the floor of Congress uh, to say that, you know, Chinese women carried venereal diseases that were lethal to white men. And so if you let them come over here, you know, they're all prostitutes anyway. And so they're really going to um, uh, degrade, uh, degrade the white family and, you know, I guess kill men with their venereal diseases. And so that was certainly part of it. Like it was anti, it was certainly an actually anti-Chinese women. So Chinese women were targeted. Um, but, you know, it, it also allowed, um, uh, it also prevented uh, uh, the travel of, of all Chinese into the United States. Um, but going back to um, Alien and Sedition Act, just, oh, okay. Well, going back, I'll just briefly talk about that. The Alien and Sedition Act was actually um, a target of the French coming from France. So, you know, I... <laughs> Let's be frank. I mean, they saw what was going on in, in, in France, right? This was the French Revolution. And so, um, you know, uh, elites in power said, okay, we want our heads to remain firmly on our necks. And so as a result of that, we're going to uh, pass something called alien sedition. And so it targeted free speech and all this other stuff, but that was really what they were, um, they were after, right? They didn't want the, the, the French coming over here and having their own revolution. Another thing to keep in mind in, in terms of kind of really shaping uh, uh, immigration was um, fugitive slave laws in the, the late 19th century. So the reason why this is important is because um, it was the beginning of the development of um, a federal bureaucracy around forced labor um, and, and uh, I'm sorry, forced movement um, that was regulated by federal agents and courts. And it's uh, and as a result of that kind of system happening, um, uh, you know, then the question, then we started to ask questions about what kind of rights they have. Um, and so though, so like the fugitive slave laws, like I said, late 19th century really um, set the stage for uh, deportation laws. Um, later on, you had, uh, you know, Alien Sedition Acts of 1718, uh, it's 
targeting people with uh, political affiliations. So, um, so like I said, you can really trace it back to the French, if you're the French, but, uh, you know, the acts of, of 1718 um, really kind of set the standard for alarm around political dissidents. So, you know, you had the Palmer raids named after the eternal attorney general. Um, and then, uh, you know, J. Edgar Hoover was also involved. It was, um, uh, you know, when he was head, head of a, a government agency at that point. And so it focused on anarchists, communists, and uh, anybody affiliated with them. Uh, so hundreds were, were hundreds of people were rounded up in the middle of the night and deported uh, on often like, you know, very little evidence, right? Uh, and they went back to Europe and other locations and most famously, Emma Goldman was subject to this deportation. She was kind of rounded up in the middle of the night. Um, so, you know, that's a very brief, um, uh, extremely, like, uh, unjustifiably brief <laughs> um, uh, summary of, of immigration laws. Um, and so, you know, oh, let me go back to sh screen sharing. So, Mm -mm. There we go. So one thing to really understand is um, at some point in the late 80s, early 90s, the face of immigration change, which is to say that the thing that people, when, when uh, people who were born in the United States thought about undocumented immigration, or really immigration at all, right? And this is not just white people, it's everybody. When they thought about immigration before the 1980s, early 90s, they thought of a, of a single uh, man, a young single man coming here and, uh, you know, mowing lawns, washing dishes, the type of stuff that I did when I was undocumented. Um, and so that actually began to change. And so it went from being, what did I do? It went from being um, a single white man to then it being a family. Um, and particularly, I mean, the subtext is always from Latin America, right? And so then the narrative changed from they're taking our jobs to now they're taking, now they're exploiting our welfare state, right? And it went from maybe seeing, um, you know, landscapers or whatever to now I'm seeing their children at the same playground that my children go to. And I'm seeing their kids at the sc same schools that I go to. And so that really informed kind of, you know, the reactionary response um, to immigration, right? So um, if I didn't ruin it, if anybody could guess, maybe put it in the chat, um, if they could um, guess what the, uh, uh, the first anti-immigrant law at the state level was, like what state holds that, holds that dubious honor? California. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I will say I accidentally shared the thing, but yeah, it is California again. <laughs> um, and so if I can share again. If I could just interject, there's a book called Long Time California, which uh, talks about that. So, you know, it's really difficult to, de to decouple um, immigration with uh, something like education, right? Especially when we're talking about a social um, a socialist feminist perspective. So, um, you know, this is around the time that we started to get the term anchor babies, right? So uh, California dropped um, Prop 187. And so a lot of it was, was focused on, uh, you know, a kind of day-to-day -day life, right? Attacking, um, uh, blocking the ability for, for immigrants to just kind of function in the world. Um, and so, uh, one point I often make when I talk about immigration is, um, uh, you know, Plyler v. Doe, which was this uh, case of the Supreme Court. What, and what happened was Plyler was a superintendent, uh, this was a school district in Texas. And so he tried to, <laughs> he tried to pass some policy so that, um, uh, immigrant, uh, uh, undocumented children had to pay for tuition right, for public education that's otherwise free and, and uh, free to everybody. And so this case actually ended up going to Supreme Court and to their, to their credit, even though the bar is very low, right, 
they they ruled that no um, undocumented children shouldn't um, have to pay tuition. And the reason I bring that up is because aside from the fact that the majority of um, like I said, it's it's impossible to decouple children from from um, uh, kind of a feminist perspective. And the fact of the matter is like teachers are seventy six percent of um, uh, the profession. But Plyler v. Doe was settled in 1982, and I was born in 1985. You know, so it's not a whole lot of time between, uh, you know, from when I was born and then when I, you know, when we came here, I was like 1990, something like that, um, 1989, 1990. And so there's not a whole lot of time between when that was settled and when I was a child in this country. Uh, so anyway, I try to uh, highlight that, but. You know, uh, California holds the honor, uh, dubious honor with 187, that kind of set the stage for 1070 in Florida. Um, I help with Florida 2040, defeat that, actually did get defeated in Florida. Um, there's, uh, you know, they passed in Georgia and Alabama and all these, um, um, all these states. So, um, you know, it kind of brings us to our next uh, maybe topic is what is the socialist view of immigration, right? And so in theory, it's been pretty, uh, pretty consistent, right? Open borders. Uh, one of the first things I ever heard was, you know, if, if, if capital and if, if stuff can travel across borders, so should people, then, right? That should be a, a right that's enshrined. Um, in practice, it's actually been uh, not all that clear. Um, so, you know, when we look at practice, we have to look at people who are in power, right? People who are uh, politicians, but maybe have sort of a socialist background. And so, uh, you know, just kind of looking to scripture, <laughs> even Marx identified uh, the potential uh, threat that is caused by, um, uh, by immigrants. So here is in a letter, uh, 1870. And so he says pretty plainly, he's talking, he's actually comparing the Irish and the, uh, the English. He says, you know, uh, there's a working class divided into two hostile camps, right? The English and the Irish. Um, and they both, you know, the ordinary English worker hates the Irish worker as a competitor who lowers the standard of life, right? And, uh, you know, actually that's been pretty consistent. So, you know, if you look at uh, Corbyn types, and I, there's not enough time in the world to talk about Brexit, and kind of what a shit show that was. Um, but I think it's actually more interesting to talk about um, uh, Jacinda, right? Jacinda, Jacinda Orden. Like Sage Jacinda. Uh, and so, you know, she's uh, often lauded by liberals. Uh, but what people don't understand is that, you know, she really, in order to form a coalition government, she had to kind of, you know, shake hands with conservatives and particularly <laughs> providing, um, um, Peters, who had, uh, you know, has been as kind of spouting anti immigrant narrative for 15 years at least. Um, and so, as part of it, actually, let me stop share. Um, I just want to make sure that I get this right. Um, Jacinda, uh, you know, she led 20 Labor's 2017 uh, electoral campaign, which introduced a proposal to cut net immigration uh, by between 20 to 30,000 people. Uh, these are for uh, three year terms. So, you know, the Labor, the spokesperson for the Labor Party denied that the pro proposal was re related to race, but, you know, around that time, and again, this is political season, right? Um, in the months preceding uh, the election, immigration was was linked to just about everything, all of the country's ills, right? From the strains on the infrastructure, the housing prices, unemployment, that at some point it was even linked to youth suicide. And so, um, uh, you know, in terms of this particular question of immigration, um, uh, you know, Jacinda, who is, all, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll stop doing it. You know, she's often lauded by liberals, right? And, and even socialists. Um, but if you look at, uh, you know, her treatment of, of uh, immigration, it's, it's really not terribly distinguishable from, um, uh, from those in, in the, the center and the far right. Uh, can I transition? Uh, alternatively, you know, you have, and again, the Swedes, uh, uh, a lot of people in DSA really law, um, law the, the, the Northern European kind of socialist, uh, what's often called socialist system. It's actually kind of you know, kinds of a Keynesian capitalism, whatever. Uh, the base certainly exists, but you know, here's a good example uh, where they said, you know, study, study Swedish or, or lose your benefits. You know, this is, this is America. No, this is Sweden. You gotta study, uh, you need to know Swedish, right? You just can't come here and take our stuff. 
And unfortunately, um, even uh, uh, even our our um, you know our own Bernie Sanders is very. Uh, he, he was asked really explicitly on a Jake, uh, Jake Tapper show um, how he felt about it, and um, sorry, I'll put it back up. Uh, how he felt about it. He really dodged the question. You know, he kind of gave like a um, uh, like a non-committal, like, well, we need, you know, uh, what do they say? We need a common sense you know, immigration reform and blah, blah, blah. It was just kind of like a non-answer. But that's also been consistent. I mean, in, in, a, in an interview with 2015, he called open borders uh, like a Koch brothers scheme. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is open borders is an idea that a lot of libertarians actually do support, and including some of the people that work in foundations funded by, um, uh, you know, the Koch brothers. And so the libertarians say that, well, some of them say that uh, they argue that open immigration would boost the economy and that states don't have the authority to, to decide where human beings can live, right? And so, you know, Bernie Sanders said, you know, he resisted that line. He argued that immigration would bring wages down, um, which is an argument that a lot of socialists make, right? Um, so, there we go. So what can we learn from all this, right? Um, I just kind of gave an overview um, that is informed by, by uh, ideas about women, women leaders, what can we learn from it? Well, actually what we can learn, which is we didn't have enough time to cover, right? Because there's not enough time in the world, not enough time. But we, you know, we never really ask why immigrants come here, right? And it's very, it's extremely fair to say, and this is, you know, it's intentionally too much text, right? It's meant to convey a message. But the United States military casts such a heavy, heavy shadow in the global South, not just Latin America. This is, I'm, I just had this for Latin America. Um, but that's really the reason why people come here. And the fact of the matter is most people don't want to move. Um, and before kind of uh, the, the, um, the building of the immigration um, uh, and deportation machine that exists in the United States, for the most part, migration was cyclical and it was driven by, it was driven by jobs. You know, people would come here, they would migrate to the United States, they work a couple seasons and then they go back home, which is where they prefer to be, which is where most people prefer to be. Um, and so, you know, that often, that question is often excluded from the conversation. And so, you know, to the extent that we'll have any sort of justice for immigrants in the United States, it really has to be firmly planted in an anti-war movement. Um, because then, then you are really challenging the reasons for why people come here. Um, so even, uh, you know, Alberto Caceres, you know, um, woman widely known uh, amongst uh, uh, feminist circles, especially in Latin America. You know, she talked about this before she was killed. Um, and she talked about Hillary Clinton and um, the imposition that the United States played in uh, Honduran politics. So I will just kind of leave it at that. So thanks, thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you, Louisa, um, for your wonderful presentation. Now, Jane's, uh, Jane is gonna take over the questions. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Jeremy, you had a question a while ago. Go ahead. I just had a thought of um, how much did the, the shape and the form of immigration into the two main media centers of the US in both like New York City and and Los Angeles kind of affect the popular understanding of what Im uh, American immigration was especially during you know when broadcast media um really became a thing during the 20th century It's a complicated question. I'm trying to think about this. Well, they certainly like there's one um particular image that got played over and over again which is, um, it was migrants, this was, must have been San Diego. They were crossing the US border and they were getting caught in traffic because they were running from, from border patrol agents. And this just got like looped over and over again in the press to really um, kind of foment anti-immigrant um, uh, anti um, uh, sentiment and show, you know, we're just criminals and blah, blah, blah. Um, 
So in terms of it being centered in New York and in LA, I mean, you're going to have that happen and you're going to have more cameras, right, as a result. So, you know, what you don't see is migration uh, to a bunch of new places, right? So like North Carolina, um, I mean, geez, even like the uh, lily white Pacific Northwest, um, you know, you're actually seeing um, immigrants and really any place where there's um, construction has a, a, a great, that's a big pull factor, right? So like you saw, um, for instance, um, a new immigrant communities in, in Atlanta after the Olympics, right? You just needed to build this big ass stadium and you needed people to build it. So I guess you see that less. Um, and so one of the things that they say when I was in graduate school is how like um, new immigrants, uh, and again, from not just from Latin America, there's a bunch of like, there's a ridiculous amount of continental Africans in North Carolina when I was there is actually really interesting. Um, huge Nigerian population, right? Um, but you don't really see that. You just kind of have to go there and, you know, go to these places and be like, oh, okay, there's a, you know, uh, like for instance, in Portland, right? There's like eight Ethiopian restaurants. Why the fuck are there eight Ethiopian restaurants in the whitest city? <laughs> and there's reasons for it. That, that one is particularly refugee resettlement, right? That's the reason why. There's no other reason why Ethiopians would be like, yeah, Portland, Oregon, rainy gray, Portland, Oregon, that's where I wanna go. And not to shit on Portland, I'm sorry. It's not to be disrespectful anyway, but I, I live here too. Um, but, <laughs> um, it, what you do, it, it certainly showcases what you, I guess to answer your question, Jeremy, what you don't see. I hope that was an answer. Yeah, I think that was a great answer, Louisa. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, well, any other, any other questions? Um, feel free to just post in the chat. I'm going to click allow to talk on all the parties, all the attendees, so you guys can just like jump in too. Jan, go ahead. So thank you, Lisa. That was a wonderful presentation and, and the, the history I think is such an important context. And I think that is part of our, our work as socialist feminists is to provide history, to kind of pull back from the pressure of the moment to, to look at um, how this has played out over time. But I, I was wondering your thoughts on the, the moral outrage during the Trump, Trump era around, you know, kids in cages and ripping babies from the arms of their mothers. And I, I think there, there is rightfully and righteously outrage about that. But then it's harder to organize around, you know, economic, you know, the so-called em economic immigrants um, versus uh, asylum seekers. So you get in this separating out the, the more tragic stories from the less. And that's kind of part of my theme around abortion too try not to rely on the tragic narratives that bring tears to people's eyes and how, how much motherhood gets used that way. So on the one hand, there are standards for care of children that need to be addressed, but how would you respond in, you know, in organizing more, more broadly around you know, which, which narratives kind of capture the center stage and which get more marginalized or summon less sympathies? Yeah, that's a good mm -hmm. question. Um, one of the things I really struggle with, with the whole, um, with what happened with immigration under Trump, like I remember I was at a work meeting and one of my colleagues like actually started <laughs> crying with the whole, bless you, Stacia, uh, actually started crying with the whole, uh, about the whole kids in cages thing. And so I didn't say this, I didn't, you know, I try to be a good organizer. But my first, you know, kind of the worst impulse that I had was, well, where were you? This has been happening for years. This didn't start with Trump, right? The babies in the cages, the, you know, children being ripped, like that, that's always been there, right? At least as I've been a, an immigrant's rights organizer. Now, obviously, that's not what I said. We don't welcome people. I mean, she's not 
she probably wasn't going to get involved anyway. But like, we don't, that's not how we welcome liberals into our movement, right? Say, well, you know, where were you? Um, but I'm realizing, I mean, it's a good question because when a Republican is in power, people are far more, you know, liberals are far more willing to kind of organize against them. We see this with the anti-war movement to the extent that it exists in the United States, right? Um, so, you know, when Bush starts a war, uh, you know, there's way more people in the streets than when Obama started uh, several wars, right? And so, uh, you know, liberals kind of really rest on their laurels in terms of, you know, having getting some, having on somebody elected who's a Democrat, uh, that they feel that they can, you know, the joke is that they can go back to brunch, right? Um, so it's a good question. Um, you know, I trend in terms of, so I just wanted to share that again, it's our worst impulses as organizers, right? Whenever we hear somebody who's interested or who, who seems sympathetic to, you know, uh, a social justice issue to just be like, well, welcome, you know, welcome to the club, that type of thing. Be really dismissive. Um, but, you know, it goes back to the way that we need to um, uh, relate everything to how it affects people in the United States. So, you know, the anti-war movement barely exists in the United States. I mean, people try, right? But it really, um, it's, it, 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 there, there's waves of it. And like I said, it's a stronger wave when it's Republican in power, but it's only a matter of time before Biden starts some shit overseas, you know, before there's some sort of escalation. It, and, so, and so relating immigration and particularly the use of foreign power in other countries is a way of explaining why so many people are, are being forced to come to the United States and couching it in a way that affects people's everyday lives, right? People who have been born, who were born here, right? Because otherwise, and I hate, I absolutely hate this, right? And I always try to avoid this. If you don't do that, then giving a shit about immigrants or immigration or the babies in the cages and all that other stuff, it comes across as charity. Right, and I will say this as somebody who grew up poor and you know very very newly middle class is like that's the last thing in the world that I want personally. Like I don't want people, and it, it kills me to have like middle class people's charity. Right, I I don't need that. I've, I've worked very hard, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, that's really never um, a narrative that you want to pursue. So any anything that can ground immigration, our understanding of immigration with how it affects everyday lives, and particularly how it how it it. Um, relates to the uh, the military industrial complex, I think is actually really successful. It's just, we don't do that, right? Because we're so often caught up in the immigrants rights movement. It's just like, please let us stay here. Please let us go to school. Um, and so we are kind of putting our, oftentimes we put ourselves in this position where we're just kind of pleading for really basic rights. Natasha, you're next on stack. Uh, yeah, um, I'd like to speak to the, the um, characterization of Portland. Um, it is true that um, I keep up with the demographic statistics of lots of different places because I just like to do it. But uh, last I checked, uh, Portland is 72% uh, white, and that has changed over the years. So it's not great, I agree. But there are a lot of hidden people, immigrants who are not counted in the census, for any number of reasons. And a lot of them are East County because Portland is getting so expensive that they're having to move further East. And uh, there's a number of DSA members who either currently teach or, or in the past have taught ESL. I have taught it myself. It's not been my, I'm a multidisciplinary educator. And uh, just working in Portland and some East County schools with young people as well as adults, I counted um, over 75 different countries represented. So those people are definitely undercounted and they definitely are important. And like you said, there's eight Ethiopian restaurants. I didn't know there was that many. I was aware of them. I've eaten at two of them, but I wasn't aware there, there were that many. So there are things that are, that are starting to change, but I feel so many immigrant people have, been, um, become, have become invisible. And I think it's important to recognize them. Thank you. Yeah, you saw a lot of that with um, when I was in South Florida with when Trump got elected. Um, you know, it's hard enough to be undocumented when you have kind of the rise of um, 
like when you have uh, acts of hate happening as a result of, of um, somebody like Trump getting elected. I mean, I remember when I was in Palm Beach County, hearing from educators who would say um, that all of a sudden the kids were, were saying anti-immigrant stuff, right? These are children. These are like kids of primary school and stuff like that. But they're repeating the rhetoric that they would hear either from their families or from the television or anything like that. And so what you saw, and this is kind of a, you know, an example of what you also saw during the rise of the deportation machine under Bush, right? And that got ramped up, super ramped up under Obama. I mean, he deported 4 million people. Is that instead of having this cyclical migration that you had, um, you know, uh, in the 80s and the 70s and the 60s and stuff like that, you had people, this is the way my professor phrased it, is hunkering down, right? They were staying here because they were afraid they weren't going to be able to come back. And so the, 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 the migration was so harrowing that they didn't want to do it again. Um, but then you have people hunkering down and then you have anti-immigrant sentiment uh, and then also uh, ramping up the deportation machine so that people didn't even want to leave their homes, right? And so we saw that. Um, uh, I saw that personally in South Florida, despite me, you know, I had my paperwork. I, you know, by the time that I got my paperwork, it was just at the end, I'm trying to think, it's two years before Obama got elected. But you had Obama um, employ policies like 287G or secure communities. 287G was really awful. It deputized local authorities so that they had, so all of a sudden you were not only a police officer, you're also an immigration officer. Right, and so um, uh, so it deputized um, um, police um, uh, departments to be able to do that type of work, and alternatively, as secure communities linked uh, local databases with federal databases. So, like, say I was an undocumented immigrant, I was driving, I'm driving, you know, I'm dropping my kid off to school, which happened all the time, right? Immigrants just driving to and from work. Um, and so I got arrested for driving without a license. And so that went to, um, that information was reconciled with the national database. Then all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm in deportation proceedings. That happened all the time. And so speaking to the invisibility, Natasha, that's actually gotten, I would say worse, um, maybe a little bit better under Trump, but it's still, like I said, people are getting deported all the time. I mean, there's not, there was a, there was under Biden, there was a, a halt, but then he's like, okay, well, we're just gonna do that for 10 minutes. Then we're then we're going to go back to, to, to things as usual. Yeah, thanks, Louisa and Natasha. Uh, Vishal, you are next. Hey, uh, thanks again, Louisa. Uh, uh, really informative and educational presentation. Um, you mentioned something about, you know, your um, uh, education in at the intersection of immigration and the labor movement. I was wondering if you could shed some light on, you know, what, uh, labor organizers should keep in mind to make a more inclusive movement um, uh, for immigrant workers as well. Thanks. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Certainly making, a, taking a, a visible public stance on immigration, right? So when I was in, um, when I was back in Florida, there were, uh, AFT at some point collaborated with um, some undocumented artists and so they created these posters that said, I support the DREAM Act, and it's the, the butterfly, right? The butterfly has been um, often used to represent that. And so, you know, putting stuff like that up in your classrooms really, I think it goes a long way for, for students who are undocumented to understand that, um, that school can be a safe space. Um, and for the most part, for the most part it is, um, when I did uh, Know Your Rights trainings in, in, like I said, back in Florida, we often did them at schools to the extent that we could. Churches were the best, right? People felt safe at church. But schools were also really, um, were also a place where people felt safe. Um, a little bit less so, but still. Um, and so, you know, going back to kind of... Uh, big cities versus large cities and the way that immigration functions there. I remember this was under Obama, um, a friend of mine who, who ran a, um, uh, um, who ran a nonprofit that helped uh, undocumented women with, with health issues, said that she had to respond to a call where immigration authorities were at a, a daycare and she had to help migrant women pick up their children. Like she had to basically run a system so that, because they were afraid to come to the preschool. 
And so, you know, there was a memo under Obama that said, look, we're we're going to deport people, but maybe let's not do that at sensitive places. Like, let's not like, well, maybe let's lay off the funerals, uh, lay off preschools, really don't do it at schools because it makes us look bad. Right. But there's still moments where, you know, this stuff happened. Um, and this was a particularly rural part of Florida. So anyway, getting back to your, I'm sorry, getting back to your question, Michelle. Um, so be, you know, taking a really visible um, stance on, on, uh, you know, immigration reform, um, and, and being mindful, you know, having things translated, being mindful of people's, you know, oftentimes immigration status is mixed within families, um, and just kind of generally um, being educated in terms of the way that that uh, labor has has been has been racist against immigrants, right? There's a long history of that with, again, with the Page Act and the Coolies and stuff like that. But also now also focusing on that, also focusing on times where, um, where there has been a partnership between immigrant workers um, and, you know, native born workers. That's also good to know. Um, and, you know, there's a reason, I mean, I think it took until 2010 for the AFL CIO to support comprehensive immigration reform. That's a long fucking time. For the AFL to be like, yeah, we're we're cool with this. Like maybe let's not support so many people. Um, but it's an ongoing conversation, and so I think visibility is really, you know, important as a contrast to this kind of anti-immigrant narrative that we hear so much. Awesome, thank you. All right. Well, fantastic. Um, yeah, that is really interesting. I love, I don't know, I love hearing about, because it's always, I mean, it's good to talk about these issues and talk about the theories, but hearing about like what specifically we can do as activists is really important. So thanks for your question, Michelle. Um, well, I guess, I mean, that is technically Louisa's time, but we have a little, but we of course have extra time since Olivia had to leave. Does anyone have any final questions for uh, Louisa or Jan before we get going? Well, I, Stack, <laughs> so small. Okay, um, I'd like to invite other questions, but before we do that, um, I would like to ask Louisa what you think we could do. Um, some of us are already involved in, in um, Latin American Solidarity. Um, I do some work with Portland Central America Solidarity Committee, but um, it's not as active as it used to be, but they're still doing stuff. So, um, and I, participated in a webinar um, in, uh, let's see, it was among U.S. people and Salvadorans, um, and it was incredible. Um, there they are in a rural area under really um, basic conditions, uh, and the everything was delayed because they were having a thunderstorm, <clears throat> but that's what it's like in the Global South, right? Everybody was very patient, though, and so what should have taken two hours took three hours, but it was wonderful to hear from people that you don't usually hear from <clears throat> people on the ground. And then I also, for International Women's Day, I heard a, a panel, uh, I think it was, it might have been C-Space Committee in Solidarity with the people of El Salvador. In any event, it was a group of, 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 of uh, Mexican and Central American women <clears throat> talking about, about these issues. It was fascinating, again, to see um, and hear from these voices that we don't always hear from. Um, and, so what, what can we do? I understand you're, you're uh, on the steering committee of the, of the International Committee. What exactly are they doing? And, and how, how can people who want to get involved with them get involved? Well, um, there is a working group in Portland, DSA, called Anti-Imperialist Working Group. Um, there's lots of ways to get plugged into the anti-war movement um, in terms of uh, Latin immigrants specifically, I mean, there's Gausa, there's Voss um, in Oregon. But again, I, you know, that those types of organizations are great if you want to be an advocate, but in terms of really impacting policy, I, you know, I really like to take it back to anti-war and um, grounding our understanding of immigration um, uh, as counter to uh, as anti-immigration being inseparable from, like I said, the industrial, um, uh, the industrial military complex. So um, folks who want to join uh, uh, the International Committee will have a wave of applicants soon. Um, we do waves, um, we do applications in waves. There is um, a, a migration 
working group in national DSA too. I think those are, I think those are, that's open. Um, but there's lots of ways to get involved through DSA specifically. But like I said, bringing it back to the anti-war stuff. Yeah, well, having been around Portland, yeah, feminist and left communities for a long time, I know that <clears throat> there are people in the anti who do most of the anti-war work who are also concerned about about international issues. Brian Wilson comes to mind, but he is currently living in Nicaragua, <clears throat> and uh, he he makes the connections. I see his postings on Facebook sometimes. So I, I think there is some there is it is some it is happening. Um, but it, it doesn't get the publicity we might want. I think that's part of it. But there are definitely people who are making the connections and have been for a long time. All right. Can I, can I speak to mm -hmm. how um, abortion rights and abortion activism within DSA? Absolutely. In closing, yeah, I I think we DSA has been very effective in organizing around um, well around House Bill three three nine one some time back, and then also around Medicare for all. And I th I think bringing abortion care into the those conversations so people are comfortable talking about abortion. There's still often a certain anxiety about even using the word abortion or talking about or feeling defensive when the topic of abortion comes up. And to, so how to, I think it's important we bring it into our conversations also about childcare. That was one of the big victories of the chapter was organizing around the uh, pre-K um, for all campaign and to say yes that's so important that we provide care and maternal or um, care work reproductive labor and care work has been so central to feminist theory and practice throughout much of our history and I think bringing abortion into the same conversations that we talk about the importance of access to child care and how difficult it is to, to bring a child into the world when you have to pay $1,500 a month for childcare or more. Um, so I, I think it, abortion often gets kind of uh, isolated from other conversations, including around uh, reproductive justice or healthcare as a whole. <clears throat> yeah, that's an excellent point. And um, if people want to get involved in that, the uh, newer member of the Feminist Caucus, um, Adriana, is organizing um, <clears throat> teams to fundraise for this, um, well, it used to be called a bola -thon, but because of COVID, we can't do it. <clears throat> and so it's basically fundraising. And if you are interested in this, um, I would suggest on Mattermost. It seems like everybody who's on here is a member. <laughs> We'd hope to get in more people, but that's okay. We'll, we'll keep trying. Anyway, so go on Mattermost, go to the Feminist Caucus, and there's information there that will plug you in to do something. You can make a donation. It's real easy. And the funds go for women who need either transportation money or um, housing money to uh, access abortion. Say if they're living in Eastern Oregon and they want to go to Bend or whatever, whatever you get the idea. And so it's definitely, it's all vetted. It's not like going to... Yeah, it's vetted and it's it's um it's legit. Well, fantastic. Um, well, thank you so much uh, to our speakers. It was really awesome having you guys here. Um, yeah, thank you for organizing this. That was fabulous. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. All right. Well, um, for our last couple minutes, I'll just go ahead and plug. Um, so the Feminist Caucus is going to be having its monthly meeting on April 2nd um, at 515, as always, first Friday. Um, and then we will also be having our, our third um, reading group on April 21st. So if you, there's, of course, information about that in the matter most. Um, and feel free to, we actually have an email now. It is, um, I'll post it in the chat. Anyone has questions? It is pdxdsa 
feminist at gmail.com if anyone has any other questions or would like to get more involved. But thank you all so much for being here. And I'd like to just give, uh, um, reiterate my thank yous to everybody who helped out. So Jane, my uh, co-chair, my partner in crime <laughs> with the <laughs> Feminist Caucus, um, Vishal Bakshi, who did uh, the graphics and um, publicity, uh, Jeremy Salmon, who's uh, done the tech work for this show, and Eric Gold, who's done communications and also started us off. So it takes a village, folks, and I'm glad that all of you helped. And um, I hope you find some other ways to celebrate Women's History Month if you so please, so are so inclined. And um, talk to me. I always have. I get. <laughs> I got so many notices regarding Women's International Women's Day and Women's History Month. It's unbelievable. So it is still growing. My first one was in 1971, marching um, from the campus of University of Wisconsin to um, the uh, State's House in Wisconsin. And it was no more than 25 degrees, folks. <laughs> Early March in Wisconsin, that's how it is. And uh, it was incredible. The three demands were equal pay for equal work, free abortion on demand, and free child care. So some, I am, I will, that will be going to the memoir that I'm also working on. So anyway, um, history is important. Thank you very much for everybody. And uh, Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Have a fantastic day. Thanks, Louisa and Jan. This was great.